All the fight has been beaten out of me. <laughs> Upstairs at Freilich, show 422, real one. This is the one I'm dreading, by the way. I just want to say. Uh, this is not. Well, you mean to, okay? We got we got to talk about one relatively bad movie, but one relatively good one. Is it possible? I mean, I know New Line. New Line is a studio, right? So if they say that something is going to be the last, but then it winds up being a hit, they're going to be like, "Fuck it, we'll do another one." Do you really did, did they really intend for Dream Child to be the final installment? Did they intend to go on, or did they say, "Let's fucking kill Freddy off once and for all"? Because the marketing of the movie, because the marketing was very big for this movie, by the way. Oh, yeah. Uh, th they they seem to be like, we're going to kill Freddy, and they make a big deal about killing him in the ads, because I have a couple of ads that I found um, on the NightmareOnElmStreetFilms.com website, and I'm putting them in here, to show that they were really marketing the hell out of this movie. Oh, they I remember the ads back in the day, but I'm going to leave you with the famous words of Austin O'Brien from Last Action Hero. It's like, Jack, you can't die until the grosses go down. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And what happened with Part 5? Grosses went down. But you also have to look at what was going on with Paramount at the time. Okay, this is a different studio, but same situation. Realistically, no Friday the 13th movie ever went gangbusters until after the, I think it was after the fourth one, maybe even the fifth one. Six, seven, and eight, they were all low-grossing movies, but Paramount kept churning them out because they cost nothing to make. But yeah, because their main movies... set is the woods. <laughs> Exactly. Except for Toronto, of course. Woods. Toronto being Except different. for, yeah, Jason takes Toronto. But six and seven um, were, okay, four, six, and seven are probably the, my favorites. And those are relatively good movies, but the audience, but the problem was Five and we were suffering much. We were suffering from slasher fatigue around that time. Freddy was at least original around this time. Freddy was something different. That's why he lasted a little longer. New Line's like, okay, this one went bust. We're now suffering Freddy fatigue. It's time to fucking kill him off. It's it's over. We're done. And I don't even think it really years. mattered. Why would you spend the money? We're, we're talking about a ten million dollar budget. Because they thought they they thought they were going to get it all back, and mm -hmm. they they didn't. I mean, the movie was movie, slightly more profitable than Dream Child, but not by much. Not by much. Considering not the marketing push they did, this was an extreme disappointment. Yeah, and it, and the whole three D angle that they did, and all the cameos opening. too. They got cameos. And all the cameos. Cameos. Johnny Depp. They got Johnny Depp. They had uh, Roseanne Barr and Tom Arnold. Alice Cooper. Alice Cooper. You got Iggy Pop doing the title song, and I, they also made a video. Oh wait, no, 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 no. The, the title song was Goo Goo Dolls. The end. The end credit song was Ziggy Pop. They made videos and they put them on MTV and they used MTV to push the movie as well. You were talking about Dream Warriors before. They did the same thing with this one. Didn't quite work out. Yeah, well, because Gen, Gen X had already, I think, Gen X was starting to become a thing around that time. Maybe. You mean? Um... I don't know. Well, because, you know, it's like, like you said, like you said, 87, 88, when four and five came out or when three and four came out, that was like during the fucking heyday of all heydays of mtv yeah but then when freddy's dead comes out nirvana has already probably been out at this point and you know nobody cared <laughs> and mtv was start well and then yeah, uh, well, mtv was starting to transition though. no it's 91 that's not really technically the beginning of the 90s for me the 90s i think we talked about this before the 90s begins with nirvana but nirvana had uh, didn't really explode until 93 94 well no, 92 i'll give you I'll, maybe I'll 92 I'll the split end. the diff and say 92. I'll split but the diff. But it still wasn't the 90s yet. The it, it, Get rid of the mullet. When you get rid of the mullet, that's the, the beginning of the 90s. That's the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, which is probably 93, 94. The death of Cobain. The death of Cobain is what really brought it home. It brought home the apathy. And that was what the 90s were about. 90s was apathy. Uh, 80s was optimism, right? 70s hmm. was apathy. 60s was optimism, right? <laughs> 50s was probably maybe forced forced optimism because it, because it was post-war and the country was booming economically but the 40s was apathy because there was war <laughs> yeah. so we, we go on but that that's when the decades die because nothing changes after 2000 i don't think anything changes except possibly Tech not, well, woke ideology media. that's about it well you forget about social media social media yes cancel culture yes uh uh but also narcissism and all that stuff just gone wild i mean it's like it's like the, the literally the last 23 years I me mean, not even the last 23 i'd say i'd say because of the social media boom let's just say myspace has been a thing for a while but it really started blowing up with smart devices like it was a whole thing when we got you know devices where we could walk around. So probably over the last 15 years, it started going really down the shitter. Yeah, yeah. 
I suppose. But anyway, but anyway, regarding Well, I mean, that's Freddy's why it dead. was dead, I mean, right? And and both franchises were dead by the time Freddy vs. Jason comes out. Yeah. It's weird. I mean, it's weird. Well, cuz like Fr- a Final Friday came out what a year later? Yeah. 93? 92, 93. So I mean, at least it's cool that I mean New Line got to kill or New Line did get to kill Freddy and Jason. I mean, and Freddy still remain dead if you think about it because we'll, we'll get into that later new line is set out to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish but a bad movie came out of it why <laughs> Another, nothing but uh, nothing but jokes nothing but one like freddie is supposed to be terrifying it's a lot of Freddy psych gags be- and it's a lot of you know Freddy just taking up a lot more screen time and them not investing as much which is weird because the character lisa zane the character that lisa zane plays is supposed to be playing freddie's daughter and, it's, and where the fuck did that come from is my question. Well, you know how it's always it always seems to be like some weird family member involved in every one of these French in every one of these Freddy movies. But there's also remember New Nightmare, how uh, he had somehow, you know, possessed uh, Heather Langenkamp's son, which we'll get to in a minute. But still, it's, it's right. sort of it's sort of a variation on a theme. It kind of reminds me a little bit of Dream Child. And then and then Freddy. uh is is instrumental in creating the dream child thing from the previous two movies so you're trying to integrate freddy krueger into the bigger storyline you're trying to make him more instead of being this creature that's on the the periphery of everyone's nightmares killing them in in fantasy scenes and sequences he is they're making him an active part of the story like active in the waking world I, i mean i guess i mean there's a good movie in here, though. There's a that's the problem. That's what really pisses me There's off. There's a lot of good ideas in this. I movie. love the it's idea just... of Lisa Zane, um, you know, running a halfway house for all these troubled kids. I like that idea. I love Yafet Kodo. He's in this movie. He's fantastic. It's okay. The movie's also ripping off Dream Warriors because of all the troubled kids and all the various ways in which and creative ways in which they die and all that stuff. Breckin Myers is probably the best. Yes, that is one of the best deaths. I, I love, dude. I love Carlos's death. Nice hearing from you, Carlos. Oh yeah, and that too. Yeah, yeah. The um, <laughs> the nails on the chalkboard with the hearing aid and all that. It's it's very sadistic and everything. But there's a lot of like Dream Warriors DNA in this as well. Even though this is there's this a... is Michael DeLuca wrote this script, based on Rachel. He, he wrote story. So, he wrote some good movies. He wrote In the Mouth of Madness. It's a fantastic film. He borrows some of Freddy's Dead for In the Mouth of Madness, though. There's a couple of bits in there. I'm trying to think because it's been a while since I've seen In the Mouth of Madness. I watched it maybe a couple weeks ago, but we were at the, quote unquote, at the bar and we had the captions on. (laughs) Well, watch them again and you'll see, you'll watch both movies. Everyone out there, watch both movies and you'll see a couple of visual and stylistic and story points that, that Michael Duke borrows liberally from. Freddy's dead and puts into in the mouth of madness. A lot of it is, is part of the dream world that he's in, but in the mouth of madness is such a more visually interesting movie because it's John Carpenter doing what he does best, which is creating visually compelling uh, film and Rachel Talley. This is her first film and she's a, she's a wonderful filmmaker. I, I like her work after this. This was a very, it, it, I don't know what it was. Maybe I think, like I said, I think it was the downturn in the economy. This movie looks so cheap compared to the previous three and maybe even it the does. First one. It's more cookie. It is more cookie. I mean, the, some of the visual effects do hold up some, some, mm-hmm. but this was also on the cusp of CGI big time cusp. Like CGI was a thing, but like not everyone could afford it. That's you know what I mean? Right. They would actually, for her next movie, they would use CGI a very, a very early form of it for ghost in the machine, which is a great film. I love that movie. That's a good movie. Yeah. But then now you look at it, you look at it two years removed. Lawn war man was done in a pickup deal. So that wasn't directly new, mm. line. but the mask, that was the last movie done in house before the Turner buyout, and that's where the CGI. Well, you know, yeah, really that's when they were doing crazy ass shit. But we're talking that was 93, 94. 94. That was ninety three, but yeah, like that it's was, only two that was years, Jurassic Park. Two that was years the year of Jurassic here Park. from her. And also, I mean, like remember, there was also the Abyss and T two before then. Those movies cost a ton because of the CGI they were doing. Exactly, but then that and what's the thread there? They're both Jim, Jim Cameron. Yeah, that's true. Right, that's both Jim Cameron. So, I mean, CGI. Okay, we we have said CGI was a thing. But you had to have some money in your pockets to use it. You know, it was expensive to use because you could do good CGI and you could do bad CGI, you know, and nobody wanted to do bad CGI. What was the, CGI. Budget? What they was wanted... the uh, production budget of the mask? Was it in the 40s, 50s, 100s? I think it was in the maybe the 30s. I got to check that out real quick. I can do that Because I know the movie was enormously second. profitable because this is when Jim Carrey exploded. It made about $300 million at the box office, right? Yeah, I made a ton of money. I, I mean, but there they were, that weekend. Jim Carrey was a weird one because he had been around for years. He makes Ace Ventura. It's it's 
almost a miracle that Warner Brothers even released that movie. The, I was I was gonna say it, but now I got confirmed. They said the budget was anywhere between eighteen and twenty three million. Oh, okay. And all and you know, but here's Probably the thing: they got all of that cheap. was all of that money was allocated for the for the visuals. Right. I'm assuming because. They probably got carried cheap before Ace Ventura really took off, right? Well, yeah, because remember he had he had filmed and completed the mask before he did Ace Ventura. All right, so there you go. He probably but because him. because the mask spent a year in post doing all, all the, the visual, visual effects. effects. And everything in that. So as soon as he got done with the mask, he went and shit out Ace Ventura <laughs> right. real quick. And Cameron Diaz wasn't a name yet either. That was her first. Yeah, film, she wasn't a name film. yet. And then Ace Ventura hit big, and then because of Ace Ventura, then the mask became like after that, New Line just went crazy and started marketing the shit out of the mask, you know. And then it got good reviews. But for the thing, this, My, we called it the house that Freddie built. They they're very cheap with Freddie. Hey, but that but that was their bread and butter. That's like, hey, we spend we spend ten million here, we'll make fifty million there, you know, and then we can take that money and put it into better movies. I was uh, you know I was doing screen caps for uh, New Nightmare, and the scene that takes place in Bob Shea's office, right? His office is littered with Freddie junk. There's like Freddie junk all over the place with pictures and and posters and figures, action figures and stuff, and little prop pieces from the you know. And the thing is. They could be a little more truthful about that. You know? Well, okay, we'll get into that. that. That's like a discussion for when we get when into we that. When we get or, into that, or, yeah. But, when we get into but, that. Like I said, there's a lot I like about this movie. It's just not visually. If they had really gone that route with Dream Master and Dream Child and put it into this movie, it would have been amazing. The The Johnny Depp cameo is really cute. Um, yes. It was nice that he came back for that. You know, I don't know what he was doing at the time. Ninety one, he was was just on the cusp of becoming this big, huge star. He was already yeah, because he had well, he had already done at this point. He had already done Edward Scissorhands and Crybaby. Jump Street. Yeah, and, well, Jump he Street. He did, but I get, he was I get. just a teen heartthrob at that point. He became right, but Edward Scissorhands was the let's just let's just face it. Edward Scissorhands was the movie that that bumped him up there. Like Edward Scissorhands was a big hit. That made Johnny Depp, you know, a movie star and everything like that. I still, I still, but, and that, at that time, I put him in the teen heartthrob column. He be, he started off as a teen heartthrob, and then he became a serious actor for a while. He had a few, he had like a bunch of movies that he did between between Edward Scissorhands and Pirates of the Caribbean that were like serious actor movies. He was a serious actor. He was committed to what he was doing, and then he does. Then he becomes the movie star, and that's the Pirates of the Caribbean stuff. Chocolat, remember, Chocolat was this. Yeah, Chocolat. It was a big hit. It became a big hit internationally because he was doing the actor thing, but he became a big movie star as a result of it, I think. You're right. He did do a lot of good, solid work. So he, he had the really benefit. He had the benefit of, of having this incredible career, but it did take a little while. It, 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 Jump Street jump-started it. Yeah. That's, that's sort of what happened. Everybody fell in love with him. Because of Jump Street. Nobody remembers him from Private Resort or Platoon. <laughs> and then they were like, oh, shit, he was in Nightmare. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I um, remember him from Private Private Resort and Platoon. I remember, I remember Private Resort because it was on cable. It was on HBO around the same time that I saw Man with One Red Shoe, Just One of the Guys, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, got a look, guy missed the 80s sometimes. God, yeah, greatest no, time man, HBO was awesome back in those days because you didn't have licensing issues and they showed any movie they felt like it. They even showed Disney <laughs> movies. They didn't go rat's ass. You, you, you just, hey, can we show your movie? Yeah, you can show my movie. Now, nowadays, everything's like, oh, no, we're under license from blah, blah, blah. No, we're under license. We can't do that. We can't show this movie on our network. Blah, 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 I wanted blah, blah, blah. to, I need to no. look this up before I forget uh, that um, Johnny Depp showed up to casting with a friend of his who was also famous and I wanted to see who. Oh, Jackie Earl Haley. I think you said it was wait, wait. accompanying his friend Jackie Earl Haley, who went on to play Freddie in the 2010 remake. Yes, that's yep, right. He Jackie was, just, he was just chilling with Jackie. Well, because they were both they were both young up and comers at that time. You got to, I mean, you got to remember Jackie Earl Haley had already done movies. You know, he, he was, was a child in, star. Bad News Bears. Yeah, bad. Like I think all three Bad News Bears movies. He did that one movie, The Zoo Gang. He did that Losing It. Movie he did Losing with, It with uh, Tom Cruise and Shelley Long. Tom Cruise. Yep. And that was like one of those, I guess teen sex comedies back in the day yeah but not a very except good except jackie o'halley is trying to put spanish fly in this woman's drink and he buys what he thinks is spanish fly but it just turns out to be aspirin and he keeps trying to come yeah. on to this girl it's hilarious it's like a you know a bunch of white kids going to mexico or some shit <laughs> i don't know why the it's, fuck it's shelly a, long is there though <laughs> it's a stupid movie i I've tr i watched it after they did a profile on it and then I was like, I yeah, even, this is nothing. I, I love stupid movies. I loved, uh, you know, Tom Cruise was in a bunch of movies. This is back when Tom Cruise was really, he was trying to do the serious actor thing, too. He's another guy 
who started off the same way as Johnny Depp. It's weird because Tom Cruise was going to do Edward Scissorhands and chose his agent told him not to. He said it would destroy his career because everybody loves his pretty face. <laughs> But for you know, it was a good move because Johnny Depp is perfect in the role. Yeah, it was a great move. I mean, his agent was well. His, his agent, agent was, was right, pimping but... him out like like a like a pimp in the street, you know, <laughs> like a prostitute. <laughs> I guess the issues are this: we we talk we haven't talked about the story, but the story's muddy anyway. The, it's a very short, simple story. This random guy is being haunted by Freddy in his nightmares. We don't know who he is. We don't know his name. We just know his name is John, John Doe. William. Freddy fucks with him, gets him into Springwood. Or outside of Springwood, like kicks him into the next town over from Springwood. And then freaking he goes to this, you know, this crisis center. Yeah. And then and then the big thing is, again, the subplots in this movie are so weird. Then all of a sudden you've got the stoner, you've got the deaf guy and you've got the traumatized chick who all steal the fucking van and they never say why. That's the Dream Warriors connection right there, I think. Yeah, they, they steal the van. And they head over, and as soon as they get into Springwood, this whole new thing has happened. Springwood is now a haunted, cursed town because of Freddy. This movie has all this aftermath, but we don't see the context or the setup to the There's aftermath. some interesting DIY uh, production design there. Yeah. That, that's, you know, it's DIY. I say DIY because it looks like anybody could do it. There was nothing very, there was nothing special about the production design of this movie. I even like, I don't know, the choice of film stock and the lighting, it just was not interesting to look at it's really disappointing in that way which is shocking to me because Tally, like i said she has a great visual eye i don't know something was holding her down maybe it was the budget like i said or it could have been or it could have been the weird screenplay or i mean let's just let's just face it this movie was supposed to be somewhat avant-garde but it ended up falling flat on its face even avant-garde would have had like a great visual sense to it and this movie tries to have a great visual sense i mean there are some good scenes in this movie there are some good ones like you said spencer's death with the video game okay yeah, boink, that, boink, boink. That... i mean well they were obviously making a comment on video games <laughs> yeah and so you forgot the about the power glove yeah, yeah, yeah. you know you know it okay that's just being riffing on something that's already popularized maybe you know, it's, nintendo maybe, was already big they had a game fucking there was already a nightmare on Elm street game there at was, this point yeah, on yeah. the nintendo on the nintendo maybe it was just that you had such incredible visuals for those previous three movies previous four movies you can't really top it maybe you can't i mean like think about it stephen hopkins he really goes way out there with the visual yeah he went for the jugular and it had great set design great I mean, again, and people were this. Bad, okay, that's bad it. Bad screenplay, but great visual design, great set design, great visual effects. That's it right there, though. Talalay is just basically pointing a camera, point and shoot, point and shoot, point and shoot. There's nothing going on there, you know. I mean, even even Freddie's makeup at this point, like Kevin Yeager did the. You could tell he did a rush job because Freddie looks like. This Freddy is when his face is more latexy. It's all latex. Like you can just tell. There's he looks no very dry. depth, and just like yeah, he in does. New there's Nightmare no too. In New Nightmare, he looks yeah. dry too. But there's a there's a reason for that. But we'll get into that. We'll yeah. get into that. I it's, um, it's just Ghost in the Machine and Tank Girl are two very Tank Girl is really amazing. Tank Girl actually has that kind of really good production design. I mean, boy, there's great a kangaroo in. <laughs> Even the K, and I think that that's Greg Canham effects right there. I want to say Greg Canham did Greg that. Greg Canham, who and, is and, uh, yeah, Greg Canham. Uh, Greg Canham. Well, he did Mrs. Doubtfire. He won the Oscar for Mrs. Doubtfire. But he did, didn't he do the Howling movies after Rob Bottin left? No, do I don't know. Oh, I'm trying to remember. remember. He did. Oh, he did Bram Stoker's Dracula, right? Yeah, Greg Canham well, let me did Dracula. Look up Canham here because I know he did a bunch of. He's another one of those guys. He's unfortunately well, he he's did... one of those guys you don't talk about as much. He did the yeah, mask. But he, won a fu- but he won a fucking Oscar. He, oh, yeah, we can't... The people can't talk about the man, but he won a fucking Oscar. Okay, No, whatever. no, they, they don't talk about him because he tends to kind of disappear in the shadow of Rick Baker and Rob Bottin. Yeah, but he's a great effect but artist. But he did Anytime Hook, you see... he did Dracula, Mrs. Doubtfire, The Mask, Titanic, Bicentennial Man, Hannibal, Passion of the Christ, oh, shit. He did Benjamin Button. He did, uh, yeah, he, he, he has, he's won um, five Academy Awards. He's actually won more than Rick Baker, <laughs> but you don't really, he doesn't. Okay. He's like another one, like Chris Wallace, Chris Wallace too. He's another yeah, guy. Yeah. He won one Oscar. He got lucky. Won one Academy award. There, there were, but no one talks, but no one talks guys, about, it. but nobody talks about Rick Baker tends to get most of the credit. Rob Bottin second. Like Rick, Rick Baker, Dick Smith, Tom Savini and Rob Bottin. Those, those guys get all Tom Savini love. as well. 
right. Kevin Yeager, even he's like a smaller, he's like small fry because it's Chucky and and later Nightmare on Elm Street movies, you know that kind of stuff. And the Crypt Keeper. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, but we're talking about the innovators here, right? Dick Smith was the innovator. And yeah, Dick Smith was the innovator, and, and he, it Rob, was the other people. Uh, Rick Baker's from the school of Dick Smith. Rob Bottin is from the school of Rick Baker. So it's sort of a lineage there. I don't know about Canham and Wallace. They're probably from different areas or something. Yeah, but then you got the other guys, uh, Alec Gillis, Tom Woodruff Jr. Well, you know who we forgot to mention? The fucking late, great Stan Winston. That, Stan that Winston. Right I think, you know, Stan it's funny. Winston. I think of Stan Winston. I think of um, dinosaurs. I know I shouldn't. I think of... I know you shouldn't. I think of I think aliens. Of ali- I think also of aliens. Did aliens, but that was based on Giger's designs. And Woodruff and Gillis are, you know, they, they wore the suits, right? Didn't they just basically make the suits? Well, they did the suits, but then they created their own effects company and all amalgamated dynamics, ADI. Whatever it is, it's all dead now. <laughs> I mean, Rick Baker yeah, said it's all dead. It's fucking dead. They get they he did the he did the werewolf with Benicio del Toro, and they took they removed his his makeup and did it all with CGI, and he just fucking retired in revulsion because of it, you know? Yeah, it's just like fuck this. It's all computers now anyway. It's it's terrible. They should bring it back. Bring it back. Bring back work. But then but then Freddy's Dead didn't do no better because like like okay, there were no computers in this movie where this movie obviously had parts where it should have had some CGI to polish up the visuals, but then some of the visuals and it got hurt. Like a lot of it was matte paintings, you know, and stop motion animation. Mm. You know, they they were still relying on that at the time. Like the whole dream demon sequence, a lot of people like that. I think it's a little hacky because it's it's just bad matte paintings and bad, you know, stop motion. It's not great. I mean, there's nothing groundbreaking about it's it. It's interesting how disappointing I w- it was because I remember, I mean, I actually remember this release. I remember this release. I remember all the all the marketing. And it's interesting. I mean, I, I wonder if, with New Line's history, what this did to them financially, considering well, nothing... you know the movie cost $10 million, but you know they spent a little bit more for marketing. As long as the movie made like, I don't even, what did it make? It like 30, 30 40 million? 35. So you figure they spent $10 million to make it and maybe anywhere between five and 10 million to market it. And a movie made 35. It made a profit. It made a little more. It made a little more than dream child. uh, And it made less than dream master and dream warriors. And, and that's when they decided, and that's, that's when they were right to hang it up because like they proved to themselves, like we spent all this money to show you that we're going to kill Freddie. But what happened? Slasher fatigue. Nobody fucking cared. Nobody went to the box office in droves to see Freddy get killed. And adversely, when they said they were going to kill off Jason, did people go to the box office in droves? No, they did not. Nobody fucking cared. It was dead. It was dead by that point because what? What what do you trace to the failure of slasher films in the early 90s? Well, in the case of Jason, it was the same. Every time they tried to put a new spin on it, nobody cared. Like, okay, like... That's too many movies. Yeah, like, it was way too many movies. Like, Jason... Like, they should have honestly stopped at, you know, the final chapter, but the movie made so much money they had to keep fucking going, and then they ran it into the ground. I mean, hell, the Saw movies, to a better extent, the Saw movies, that's, like, the only series of films I can think of that has, like, eight or nine fucking entries in them. Even they knew when to quit. Like, after the fifth one didn't do all that well, they finally ended it with the sixth one. But guess what? When they ended it, it was terrible. Like, the sixth movie's a joke. So, not the sixth movie, the seventh one. Saw. I stopped watching they Saw after the, the first one. <laughs> yeah, I well, thought you were talking about seven, the new I'm blood. I was saying, like, I love the new blood. Oh, no, it's no, fantastic. No. It's I like, love the new blood. It's like too, Carrie, but... mixing Carrie with Jason. It's awesome. And Lar Park But Lincoln that's exactly awesome. why the new blood failed, because they tried to do this old telekinetic bullshit with Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> with fucking Bernie. Um, but anyway, no, I was just going back to Saw for a second. After this, the, the sixth movie did not do well, that's when they decided to end it at the seventh one. But, but, and but then, I have to point well, out, Jigs... Torture okay. porn replaced slashers. Yes. Remember Hostel? Hostel came out? Yeah, I was going to say, Eli Roth and the guys who did fucking Saw are responsible for the whole torture, torture What's porn What's that other boom. one? Uh, wrong Turn? You know, they well, made wrong, five, no, they wrong, wrong turns, wrong, wrong turn turns movies. a creature, wrong turns a creature feature, dude. I don't consider, that was, pre, that predated that. Wrong turns a creature feature eh. that came up. It's a to me, it's a creature feature. It's not torture. Then you form. have then you have your deconstruction of slasher movies like like Hatchet. Hatchet's a good throwback though. That's like a good. It's slasher. it's me. I... The guy who made it obviously loved slasher. He hired all the people from slasher films to be in it. You know, he's got like Tony Todd. He's got Kane Hodder playing Victor Crowley. 
you know, he's got like a whole cast of people who are in horror films. It's uh, what's her name? The the chick from Halloween. I forgot. Daniel Harris. Daniel Harris is the hero of those three saw. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the three Hatchet movies. So obviously, it's made with love. It's like he's like a. I don't know. You know, I like him more than Eli Roth. Eli Roth is kind of um. You know, I don't know. He's not. He's it doesn't quite. He's not like. You know, I I consider that guy to be more of a Tarantino type, a guy who really loves the stuff. I think Eli Roth is basically more of a uh, like a, a a showman, more than anything. He is because brutal honesty. I love I love Cabin Fever. Cabin okay. Fever is another one. I love the shit out of Cabin Fever. I love that fucking. Movie. I really liked. Ho- I, I like the first Hostel movie. I did. The first Hostel is good. The less we talk about the second one, the better. Yeah, I'm, it's um, just it's a different it's a different age. These are not these are slasher. Mo- I mean, oh, Freddy is more. I don't know, more like a combination of art film and slasher film, sort of. Friday the 13th is straight up slasher, a sleepaway camp, prom night, that kind of stuff. They did try to remake all these movies. It's interesting, too. Uh, My Bloody Valentine, they didn't, tried, they make, um, didn't they remake but My Bloody Valentine, too? Yeah, and the remake was actually semi decent. Like, I'm not, it wasn't anything groundbreaking. They had the whole 3D shtick to go with it. Remember the but Prowler, they had, the uh, Burning? I mean, like, these, these, these were, yeah, like, I, ha- I own all those movies, dude. Those, that's, the, again, that was the slasher fucking boom, Pretty dude. awesome. These were, there's a, yeah, it, it was, they were making money. And that was, my God, I was thinking about the 80s and, and what the movies were that were making money. Um, family movies were not making money in the 80s. Slasher movies and, Sex comedies were making money. They were the movies that were actually making the money. And then to a lesser extent, you know, of course, you know, you got your blockbuster, you know, studios came out with their blockbuster movies. Yeah, but, but blockbuster movies were was... few and far between. Most movies were being made on, on medium to low budgets and just being put out there. And that, and you also have to remember that was during the home video boom because a lot of movies were just being made to like quickly get a theatrical release and, and they say, oh yeah, out. we're just going to make it, we're going to make it back in rentals. On and then video, so. they were like, fuck it, let's just do direct to video at that point. Yeah. <laughs> so they made movies directly to go to video. Hey, there were some good straight to video movies out there. You don't yeah, get to the me, full, full moon notwithstanding, of course. To me, but I, I see direct to video as the granddaddy of streaming. Most movies are being made to be streamed now, you know? They're not being made for yes. big screens. They're being made for big screens in your living room, but not big screens where you go out and actually... But then what's funny about most of those most of those straight-to-streaming movies, half of them aren't even that great. I, You know, you're talking, you're talking like hundreds of movies. You find maybe a handful that are anyway decent. Well, what, once, I, what I find one, ironic... Once in a blue moon, there's a jewel in the rough. And, it, and there, there, there was a movie that did impress me that I found on Netflix that wasn't available anywhere. It was made for no money with a cheap video camera. And it was a really good movie. And I wrote a review of it for Second Union. If I could find the title, I'll, I'll let you know what it was. Well, recently, um, that movie Air, the Matt Damon, Ben Affleck movie, and then uh. Evil Dead Rise... Both of those movies were actually meant to go straight to streaming. Yeah, because yeah, why were you going to go to a movie theater to watch a, uh, how they made a shoe for Michael Jordan? <laughs> it's not exactly well, that, cinematic. But, but what's funny about it is that movie's getting that movie is getting Oscar buzz. Why? Because I, you know, dude, I haven't seen the movie yet, and I want to because number one, you know how I feel about Ben Affleck as a director. I think he's a brilliant director. He's an okay director. I wouldn't call. I wouldn't go so far as to call him brilliant. Man's an Academy Award winning director. Dude, Samoan, he can't help it. <laughs> oh, whatever, whatever. <laughs> I had to. I wouldn't go so far as to call the brother fat. He's I wouldn't go so far as to call the brother fat. He's Samoan. He can't help. No, it. Ben Affleck is <laughs> Samoan. He can't help it. Now, yeah. Ben Affleck has had the benefit of working with brilliant directors and got osmosis. So, some. Okay, yeah. I found the name of the movie I was talking about. Uh, I had to do. I had an assignment for Second Union. I had to do a bunch of streaming horror movies that were available on streaming. I found a movie. It was called Murder Party, and it's a really good movie. I recommend anyone see it. It's brilliant. It's a nice, it's it's a New York City Halloween movie. It's made by somebody who had was made for no money, but it's a great horror film. All you right. can find it. Maybe hopefully it's still on Netflix. But it's called Murder Party. It's a very clever, creative film. Well, it is possible to make decent horror films. And the great thing about horror is, it doesn't necessarily cost any money. You know, I remember the first four Friday the Thirteenth movies played on cable when I was a kid in Tennessee. We were living out in the middle of nowhere, and that's that's where you really get scared is when you're watching Friday the 13th movies and you're in the, living in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, that would, yeah. That's why I hated watching movies at my, like horror movies at my grandma's house because it was the same exact way. My grandma lived in Ohio. Same exact shit. You were just like, you're literally out in the middle of fucking yeah, nowhere. Yeah. And then I watched those movies again 
later on when we were living in upstate New York and again surrounded by nothing and you could hear the branches on the trees swaying in the wind and you hear you hear something like a snap of a branch and you're jumping for the ceiling fan watching these Friday 13th movies because you're scared to death. Yeah. It's the best time to watch a movie is when you're really scared. When you're living in a, you know, in a house in New York, in the middle of New York City, surrounded by other people, you know, that are all crazy New Yorkers. There's nothing. Yeah. It's like life there. outside <laughs> is scarier than any fucking movie. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Especially when you're, especially when you're living in Chicago too. It's like life in Chicago is still the same way. Uh, right. The movies are a great escape. You know, the, this is just escape the horrors of real life. There was also some early deconstructionist horror that was going on around the same time as Freddy's Dead and also the, that in the middle of that whole thing. And that's the beginning of, of this kind of Henry portrait of a serial killer thing. That's a frightening movie in and of itself. Kind of makes you take a step back and look at Freddy and look at Jason and think they're rather silly compared to this ra- incredibly human monster. Yeah. Freddy is, is like a, an elemental force and he begins to become one more so in the in the next movie which is a um a, a, re- a self-referential horror movie well this could be actually be considered the first real meta horror movie it could well let's finish up freddy's dead uh ba ba lisa zane figures out that freddy was her dad freddy uh she goes back into Fre- for some reason she gets to explore inside freddy's mind and we get to see a little bit of freddy's childhood where he is abused by his father played by alice cooper and that was a nice little cameo too alice cooper did the same thing for for well he shows up well, he does the Prince of Darkness, John Carpenter. He shows up in Prince of Darkness. He does the he's back the man behind the mask song for yep. Friday the 13th, part six. Jason lives. Alice Cooper must be a fan of horror films or maybe the filmmakers are fans of his his music. Probably. Uh, now, I, I like I like Lisa Zane. Um, I do like her. I, she's in plenty of movies. She's Billy Zane's older sister. I was going to say I like her brother a little bit more. She isn't given much to do, though, except look concerned. That's about it. Yeah, she's just there to react. But we're doing the same thing again, which is the final. But you got, but, but you, well, you forgot, you got Yafit Kato. Yes, yes. And Rest he's good in, in this. He's yeah, he's really good in this movie. He is good. It's great to see him. It's great to see him. The cameos from Tom and Roseanne are a little distracting and so dated. Yeah, like that's how you know it's a '90s movie. Just when you look at that that cameo, you're just like, ugh, you shudder. You're like, ew. Yeah. Ugh. Uh, but Bob Shea again pops up again. And it's like. Don't want to miss the bus. <laughs> uh, and also, Eleanor Donahue, out of nowhere, she plays the woman in the orphanage. She was on Father Knows Best, and she was also on a great show that I remember when I was a kid that started out on when Fox first started as a network. Um, it was The Misadventures of Beans Baxter, starring Jonathan Ward and a couple other people. It was a, oh, Savage Steve Holland made it, so, you know. Okay, yeah. I know, I've heard about that show, and I know it did not do very it well. It didn't do very well because Fox was just starting out, but it was a great show. It was a really yeah, great Yeah, I show. heard a lot of people liked it, but it just didn't get an audience, you know? Yeah, yeah, because it was like the beginning of their network, and... There were a lot of shows back then. Well, just remember, as the history scholars have said, New Line Cinema is the house that Freddie built. The Fox Network is the network that The Simpsons built. That's true. And Married with Children. Married with Children got to piggyback off of The Simpsons' success. And, uh, okay, oh, she was also on Get a Life, the Chris Elliott show. That was also Which was, I heard, another great show that just was... It didn't last but very that was, long. Chris, it, Chris, didn't, it lasted like a season. You, make, you Back then, you really couldn't pull off a show where Chris Elliott was the lead nowadays maybe okay and also she was uh uh, jane seymour's mom on dr quinn medicine woman she's been around forever and she was in a great teen exploitation movie called girls town with mamie van doren which i recommend it's a lot of fun okay Uh, and she was on an episode of star trek anyway in all this stuff Mm -hmm. anywho uh so if you're looking for something that's going to equal the brilliance of the previous movies uh, Freddy's Dead doesn't really do it. I know that you that you that that you don't really prefer Freddy's Revenge compared. Yeah, Freddy's Revenge is like the the one you don't like as much, right? To me, that's the honest to goodness black sheep because it doesn't. I mean, even though Freddy's Dead and Freddy's Revenge don't follow the formula of one, three, four, and five, I would rather probably watch Freddy's Dead because it's a train wreck of a movie that I, that I kind of sort of like, whereas Freddy's revenge, I just don't. Mm. I've, I, I tried liking that movie when I was a kid. I mean, it has some great effects. I'll say this much for, for the second one. It's got some great makeup. It's got some innovative kill scenes. It's a visually more interesting looking movie than this one. 
Yeah, probably. It's more visually because there's no there's no bullshit special effects going on. There's just makeup. There's not, you know, there's no uh, visual effects, more or less. Can I know we, the difference. Can we, can we get technical for a second? Sure. Uh, there is something I noticed that was different about Freddy's Dead. It looked a lot grainier than the previous Well, movies. you got to also remember that's the film stock. That, that, yeah, that that, that's why I have to wonder what did how they pick a different film stock. Well, yeah, because New Line could afford better. I mean, dude, they were still using cheap, you know, one one seven eight stock, but they were at least using better. St- like they were using well, good stock. You know, you, for the lower, the lower film grain speeds, you have to use more lighting, and it brings out more color. But when you're using a faster speed, you're going to get higher grain. And it didn't look like they were shooting this with anything more than you know just basic lighting. You know, I think it was probably it wasn't a, a very standard. colorful film. I know, I know this much. I don't think the New Line movies were big Panavision movies. I think they used Airflex cameras oh, no. on these, most these of these. These are all one eighty-five to one. They're not. Yeah, it was all Airflex cameras. They were doing. I know they did some special three D stuff, and I had a I had a girlfriend at the time who still kept her her Freddy's Dead, three uh, D glasses. I still have mine from my laser disc. <laughs> it came with. Yeah, came with I think four pairs of a. Uh, Four pairs of glasses. Did they actually show it in 3D on the laser? Yes, they do. Yeah. At the very, uh, at the very end, the last sequence. I think it's a separate. Fe- I'm trying to remember maybe if it's that a was separate why. feature or it's integrated in. I'm trying to remember. I you think know what? The maybe DVD... that's the reason why it kind of looks really grainy and kind of fuzzy too at the same time because. 3D technology back then wasn't that great. There were only a couple of good examples of really good 3D movies. Um, what was Space Hunter, Adventures in the Forbidden Zone, what looked really good in 3D. Uh, and Friday the 13th Part 3, surprisingly, looked really good in 3D. But most other 3D movies looked terrible, like The Man Who Wasn't There and Jaws 3D and stuff like that. And then, uh, what was it, Amityville Horror 3D didn't oh look all God, that good. I, you know, I totally forgot that movie was in 3D. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that looked terrible. Yeah. That one looked and terrible. You can tell. That was cheap. That was. I don't know what kind of cameras movie. they were using, but they, for some reason, the Friday Thirteenth movie didn't look terrible. You know, and neither did Space Hunter. But maybe I don't know. Maybe they had problems with it for Freddy's Dead. Well, you also have to remember the two D conversions of these movies don't look all that good. Like especially the early eighties ones. I mean, like Jaws, for example. Jaws. So Jaws three D. I don't want to get too far off. We're not talking about the movie. We're just going to talk about like what happens because of you know using three D stock. Okay. The, the Blu-ray I have of it, people have given that Blu-ray low scores. Of course. I don't, give it a, I don't give it a low score on the picture quality. I say, look, what you're seeing is an accurate representation of 2D conversion of 3D film stock. And it looks like shit. Yeah. And that's how it's going to look. It's like you can only polish a turd so fucking yeah, much. Yeah, I saw it in the theater. I Jaws saw it. Three, Jaws 3 is never going to look pristine it will never or look, cleaned up. It, that's it will the best, never look That's good. the best you're going to get, pretty much. That's how right. it looked in the movie theater, too. It looked terrible. But the 3D f- effects, when they did them, looked pretty good. It was really cool seeing some shit coming right at you. And it really was coming right at you, too. Jaws 3 was just trash. <laughs> I um, love it. I, mean, I, I love the movie. I know it's stupid, but I love it. Oh, yeah. it's, it's Oh, it's good trash. Don't get me wrong. I like the movie as a whole. Fine. I can just live without the 3D. I love Dennis Quaid. I love Bess Armstrong. I love we, Louis Gossett Jr. Enough, some my damn shots, mother. <laughs> My buddy's got a 3D TV. He's one of the last remaining friends. My neighbor has a 3D TV, and we watched Jaws 3 in 3D. Oh, God, it hurt. <laughs> it, it, it hurt. <laughs> but what sucks is we want to, I want to watch fucking Freddy in 3D, but he won't because he hates slashers. Uh, Freddy's Dead is just, it's a unmemorable final nail in the coffin of this franchise. It was just like, why? Uh, could have It could have been a hell of a lot better. But mm-hmm. moving right along Wait, to um, the well, oh, go ahead. just a little uh, epilogue about Rachel Talalay. She went on to become a, a really fine director. Uh, but like I said, Ghost in the Machine is really good. Tank Girl was great. Tank Girl was it was disappointing that the film flopped because it was so brilliant. And Laurie Petty is one of the great actresses. Well, that buddy you couldn't market that movie, dude. That movie was unmarketable. No. It was an apocalyptic kind of Mad Max thing, and it was, and it was. What's more, it was ahead of its time because you had a girl boss, and I hate using that fucking phrase because that sounds like something my daughter would say. Yeah, well, the problem is, dude, this movie, that movie was made for the fucking MTV generation, mm. and only the MTV kids were gonna go fucking see it. I mean, right. it, again, it, it's not a bad movie. I love Tank Girl. Don't get me wrong. It was just a hard movie to fucking market. Mm. 
you know, and everyone at the time. At the time. At the time. Yeah, at the today, time. At the time. today, that movie would be very good. Very good. Uh, she did go on to direct in television and probably have much more successful career in television. She's another director, like all the ones we talked about before, who found a second life in television. She directed Ally McBeal, Boston Public. She directed Crossing Jordan, The Dead Zone. She she also uh, directed Supernatural and. And then uh, she wound up, uh, she started directing for Doctor Who and directed some of the best episodes of Doctor Who. For the oh, show. there you go. So, and she's also directed The Flash and Supergirl, Riverdale. And her most recent credit here is for the revival, the re reboot of Quantum Leap. I don't know anything about that. I can't believe they did that. Let me see. I knew about the reboot. It got another season. Um, it's basically, I'm... okay, it's, it's, it's the same premise and they... they it's just the same premise. That's all. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed the original Quantum Leap, though. No, who didn't? <laughs> <laughs> Him, ripped him off and abused him. Another junket plan. 